Yes. Okay. Okay. So, hi. Uh, so my name is Michael Sitwell, and I'm a, a physicist, and I've been working in physics for about 15 years now, and I've done a bunch of different things uh, in my career, but they've all sort of involved things beyond the Earth's surface. So I've studied things in astrophysics and cosmology, as well as a uh, number of different subjects in atmospheric science. So I was just going to uh, describe um, an overview of these subjects, starting from things really close to the surface of the Earth and going pretty far uh, away from the surface of the Earth into the farthest distances we've ever been able to see. So just a quick description, um, if you've never really heard these terms before. So atmospheric sciences are basically things that study the atmosphere, the air, around not only the Earth, but potentially other planets as well. And it studies things like, well, how is this atmosphere changing? What is the atmosphere made of? And if there's life on the planet that you're concerned with, how does that affect people um, who might live on this planet or plants or animals? And if we go beyond our own atmosphere, we get into outer space. And you often see this described as various parts of astrophysics. Um, so, and the part that I used to study uh, when I studied a lot of astrophysics is something called cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the universe basically as a whole on very big scales. So in cosmology, we ask questions like, how big is the universe and what is the universe really made of? And is the universe evolving? And if so, how is it evolving? Uh, so we learn all of these things in atmospheric science and about outer space by basically looking up uh, into the atmosphere, into outer space. So I just drew a quick uh, sort of just cartoon of the ways we do this. So one of the ways we do it is using ground-based stations like a weather-based station or a radar station pictured right here. Uh, can you see the, the mouse, by the way? Yes. Okay, so right over here we have a radar station that's looking up into the atmosphere, say looking at a cloud or looking at uh, rain that might be on the way and could tell us what the weather is like and if it's gonna be stormy out. There also might be a instrument on the ground that say a, a radar station, or a radio station I should say, that's looking up to a distant galaxy over here from the ground. But as I'm sure you know, there's other ways of looking up into the uh, space in the atmosphere as well. Uh, one of the most useful tools we have is satellites which are orbit around the Earth, such as these two ones. So many different satellites exist and they look at different things. So the one I pictured right here on the left is looking down at the Earth. So it could show us what the Earth looks like from space, but it could also peer into our atmosphere and gives us clues as what our atmosphere is made of, what chemicals could be in our air, and how that might affect human health and also plant and animal health as well. But we could also have another satellite that is, say, not looking down at the Earth and is looking up somewhere else, down in distant outer space. So the satellite that I pictured over here is looking at another distant galaxy uh, that might be doing something interesting and we could learn about. So we could really use these tools in a number of different ways, looking at stuff really close to Earth but also things that are really, really far away as well. So personally, I've worked on a couple of different projects and I've just put some pictures of some of the satellites and stations on the ground that I've worked on. Uh, when I was a PhD student at the University of British Columbia, I worked on something that was called a radio telescope, um, which I put a picture of in the lower left. 
and it is in a place called uh, Penticton, BC. It's a smallish town in the interior of British Columbia, and it's basically pointed up uh, into outer space looking at signals from different parts of the galaxy uh, that sends us information from radio waves. I've also worked on a number of different other satellites that's looking down towards Earth into our atmosphere, such as this satellite over here, which is the Aura satellite, giving us information about what's in our air, and a couple other satellites that I've worked on as well. Uh, so this is a little diagram of the different layers of our atmosphere and different things happen in different layers of our atmosphere. So you can see right down here is Earth, and then we have the lowest layer over here, which is called the troposphere, which is where we live. Uh, and all of our comings and going, most of the weather too, uh, happens in the troposphere. A bit above, we see the ozone layer, which has a chemical called ozone that protects the life on Earth from incoming uh, radiation or be high energy beams of light from the sun that if it wasn't there it would harm us it would it's not so good uh, for cells if they have a lot of this UV radiation so it's really a barrier a shield uh, from the earth uh, from the dangerous rays of the sun and you've probably heard this the stratosphere a lot of people use it in sort of everyday speech saying oh this and that's in the stratosphere so the stratosphere really is the next layer uh, above uh, the troposphere in our atmosphere. And it's usually about 10 to 15 kilometers um, above the Earth's surface. And then there's a bunch of different other uh, higher up layers as well. The, meso the mesosphere is one of them. Another one's called the thermosphere. Uh, sometimes we don't concentrate on these as much uh, because they're really, really far away from humans on the surface of the Earth. But a lot of people still study them as well, and they can teach us a lot of interesting things about what life is like um, in the vicinity of the Earth. So there's a lot of different reasons why it's very good for us to study our atmosphere around Earth. One of the most obvious ones is telling us about weather. So the weather really affects um, our everyday life and being in Canada, I'm sure you, you could relate. Sometimes there's snowstorms, sometimes there's severe weather events, it could get really icy out. And it's really good if we could predict these events and tell people when they're coming so people could prepare for them. Uh, a snowstorm or an ice storm is one of the most obvious um, for us just coming out of winter in Canada. But in other parts of the world, um, there could be severe hurricanes and tsunamis. So if we get a really good understanding of our atmosphere, we could start predicting them and telling people just what the weather is going to be like. Do you have to be concerned or not? Maybe you want to stay inside. Uh, so that's really helpful for us. Uh, another one, which I actually now concentrate uh, most of my work in, is studying pollution in our atmosphere. So a lot of the things that humans do on the surface of the earth actually puts out many different chemicals into the air. And this is the air that we breathe, uh, it's the air that animals breathe, and it could also affect the way plants grow. So if we're gonna be doing these things, we really wanna make sure we're not putting out too much pollution, these potentially dangerous chemicals, uh, into our air. So scientists uh, like me and the people that I work with now try to track this pollution and making sure that it doesn't become too much that it could really uh, harm people from breathing it in or it getting into our food or any other ways, harming our crops, which sometimes happens. Uh, so a lot of what I do is trying to track the pollution I may make maps of where the pollution's gathering and where it could be affecting human life. So um, in the right picture um, is a picture of this gas that I mentioned before, uh, ozone. So it's a map of ozone, which ozone is very good, high up in the stratosphere, 
uh, giving us this shield from the harmful radiation that I talked about before, but it's actually really bad for us to breathe in when it goes into your lungs. Uh, it could be really not good for human health. Uh, so this is one of the things that the government and other scientists want to track and make maps of and making sure that if there is a place where there's a lot of this pollution, for instance, ozone, that we could warn people or maybe do something about it to um, make sure people aren't breathing too much of it. Another thing that I don't personally study, but I have other people at work um, who study it are the climate. So climate studies the things about our atmosphere that uh, take a long time to happen. Uh, one of the most talked about things is uh, temperature changes over very long periods of time and seeing how that might uh, affect human life and also plant and animal life on the surface of the earth. And I just put up this picture again. Um, to uh, illustrate one of the other things that I'm involved with, which is making maps of the ozone layer. So the same way we wanna make maps showing where there could be a lot of pollution, uh, we also wanna make maps where a lot of the ozone is, because if there isn't a lot of ozone there, it means we could have a lot of this dangerous beams of light from the sun coming in on us and hitting people. And it's especially, it could be really not good for uh, your skin if you're out in the sun too long. So another thing that we produce, some of the maps, are maps of where we have this intense UV radiation and the ozone. Uh, so again, we could warn people if there are certain places uh, where there's too much UV radiation and we say, well, maybe you shouldn't be outside too much on those particular days. So I'm gonna zoom it out one layer now and look at the Earth as one might observe from outer space. And this is what maybe a satellite uh, could look at. But this is really just the beginning of our story when it comes to the second subject, uh, astrophysics, which really explores further into outer space and beyond. So I'm sure you recognize this picture. It's a picture of the solar system. So the Earth isn't alone uh, next to our sun. There's a bunch of other planets around it and they all orbit the sun. The sun is just absolutely humongous and massive compared to all these other planets and really provides us with most of the energy uh, that we need to live on the surface of the Earth. And if we zoom out one other layer, uh, we have the Milky Way galaxy. So a galaxy is a collection of billions and billions of stars. And our sun is just one of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy. And we can see here is our location in our galaxy. There's this area right here um, is referred to as the bulge and it contains a huge collection of stars. And then we can see it sort of fans out a little and we're about halfway in between the outer edges of our galaxy and the very center orbiting around the galaxy center right over here. So there's about a hundred to four billion stars within our, within our Milky Way galaxy. And if we just think about that for a second, how big of a number this is, uh, could be really quite amazing. And if we just think about how our sun is just one of these stars, we can think about, well, how many planets are there just within our single galaxy? Uh, how many of these planets could be inhabitable? Could there be life on it? Are there aliens in other particular parts of the galaxy? Maybe trying to contact us or don't even realize uh, we're there. So thinking about how big this number is, is really quite amazing. We could also ask, well, how big is our galaxy where uh, we live? So you can imagine that if I just gave you the number in sort of kilometers or inches, it would be such a huge number that it's really hard 
to get your mind wrapped around what that really means. So in astrophysics, we often use a different type of method to measure distance, um, one of which is called a light year. So a light year is the distance that a beam of light could travel in within one year. I sort of made this simple picture uh, illustrating it right here. And light is really, really fast. It's actually the fastest thing that we think could even travel in, in our universe. So it's, it's the fastest thing. So if you had a beam of light that started right over here on one edge of the galaxy, and it shone right into the middle of the galaxy, traveled all this distance into one of the other edge on the other side. It would take it about 100,000 years to make that journey from one edge of the Milky Way galaxy to the other. And that's light, which is the fastest thing possible. So you could just imagine that if you were to take a spaceship from one edge of the galaxy to the other, it would take millions and millions and millions of years. So these numbers are just really amazing to think about how big just our own galaxy is. But we could zoom out another level and it turns out that our galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy, is only one galaxy in a sea of other galaxies. And we've looked out into outer space and saw many, many, many other galaxies as well. So this is a picture of other galaxies that we've seen beyond ours. And in a way, it kind of just looks like if you sit down at a table and take in a salt shaker, just shaking the salt everywhere, like each one of the grains of salt is like a galaxy, each with billions and billions of stars in it. And that's what we see when we look up into our sky. So it's, when we think about there's billions and billions of stars in one galaxy, and there's so many galaxies, just how many planets and stars are really in our universe that we could see. Uh, it's really quite, uh, quite amazing. And now I'm going to talk about some of the really weird and crazy stuff that we've uh, seen or theorized that could be in outer space in our universe, which is so different from the type of things that we're used to seeing down on Earth. And the first thing that you might have heard of before is something called a black hole. And a black hole is an object in outer space that is so extremely dense and heavy that it sucks in basically everything that's near it. And it's so strong at sucking all these things in that it could even suck in light. And because of that, uh, black holes just look like nothing. They just look like black. But they're sucking in everything around it that gets into a certain distance from the black hole. So it's, uh, it's a really uh, crazy object that's in outer space. And well, you might ask, well, what happens if you were heroic enough to travel into a black hole? And it certainly wouldn't be a nice experience. Uh, the gravitational forces uh, around the black hole are really immense and basically crushes everything. But eventually you'd get to the center of the black hole and we actually don't really exactly know what happens uh, completely at the center of a black hole, uh, which is an interesting thing about science because there's questions that are unanswered that we don't know about. And you might want to grow up and become a scientist and say, okay, I'm going to be the person that really figures out what's happening inside of a black hole because uh, nobody's really figured it out yet. So it's, Science isn't a thing that we've completely figured out and we have a book that tells us everything. We know lots and lots and lots of things, but there are still many questions we don't know, which is why it's exciting to be a scientist because you could be the person that figures this out. Another thing which I studied quite a bit uh, during uh, my PhD was something called dark matter. So dark matter 
like a black hole, it doesn't really look like anything. Uh, it doesn't emit light, it can't reflect light, uh, which is why it's called dark. And there's a bunch of this mysterious substance all over the universe. So you could have, say, a basketball made of dark matter. Uh, it's kind of hard to get one of those right now, but if you just did a thought experiment, it would feel kind of maybe like a normal basketball. It would have mass, it would be heavy, but it doesn't look like anything. It just looks like black because it's not interacting with the light. And one of the interesting things that we found out about uh, within the last 100 years or so is that our universe is filled with tons and tons of dark matter by the look of it. And we actually think right now that there's about five times more of this mysterious dark matter in the universe than just the normal matter that our houses and cars and whatnot are made of, which is, again, really, really quite amazing that the universe has so much of this mysterious dark matter in it. And so here we have, uh, th this isn't, this is just a picture, this, just an artist sort of imagining what dark matter might be like. Uh, so it is, it's just an artist who drew it, but it kind of gives you maybe a bit of an idea of what's out there in the deep, deep dark universe that, that we can't see, but we know about anyways, because we see its gravitational attraction in the universe. Another thing that we found out in the, about the last hundred years is that our universe is actually expanding. What this basically means is the different galaxies that I was talking about before are not just staying put. They're actually getting further and further away from one another. And what's really interesting is that they're not just getting further apart from one another because they're just traveling, but the fabric of space itself is expanding. So you can imagine that if you were an ant on the surface of a balloon that is being blown up. So there's the ant on the balloon and you're blowing it up and it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. The balloon is stretching and it's getting, distances are getting further and further away from the ant. So that's what the universe is kind of like as just an analogy of its expansion. Um, so we have another artist rendering over here of our universe getting stretched bigger and bigger and things sort of getting more and more spread out over time. And another thing that we've learned about since maybe uh, the 1990s is that our universe is not only expanding, but recently it's actually getting faster and faster and faster in its expansion. And we don't really, we haven't really figured out why exactly it's getting faster and faster. But we've given a name to the thing that is the cause of it, which is something called dark energy. And even though we don't really know what this dark energy is right now, people are working very hard to come up with different ideas of what it could be and come up with different tests to see if these theories are right or not. And that's kind of what's happening in our universe in sort of the more recent times. But then we can look back in our universe as our universe gets smaller and smaller and hotter and hotter and hotter. And eventually we go back to a time that's really far back uh, that we've called the Big Bang, where our universe was just extremely hot, dense, and energetic. And at this time where we had the Big Bang was about uh, 14 billion years ago. So obviously an extremely long time ago. But at the same time, we've said, okay, this is how old the universe is. And it has a finite age from what we could tell, which is also like a really, a really incredible thing. And we've actually taken pictures, basically, of what the universe looked like uh, when it was about 13 billion years ago. So this is something which um, is called the cosmic microwave background that I pictured over here. And it looks like a bunch of 
dots and stuff, and it's basically showing us how hot of this light was when the universe was super, super hot and very dense uh, when our universe was very, very young. So this is what the universe basically would have looked like about 13 billion years ago. And it's not exactly a picture, but it is uh, a diagram of the light that we could still see, which is now very, very faint in our universe. And we could make maps of it and gives us clues of how uh, the big things in our universe, like galaxies, formed through its evolution from this very baby, baby universe to the universe that we live in right now. So all sorts of exciting and interesting things that we could study um, out in the atmosphere and outer space uh, from just a meter or a kilometer above the surface of the Earth to the biggest uh, distances that we could even see millions and millions of light years away to where we see many, many galaxies. So that's just a really short introduction to all sorts of stuff that is basically above the surface of uh, the Earth. And so, yeah, that, that's what I had planned right now. So if anybody has any questions about space or atmosphere or anything in physics, I could do the best I can. Uh, yeah, there's some, somebody with their hand raised. Um, you said that the universe is expanding. Um, so that means it must have an end. Then what's on the other side? Well, so that, that's actually a really good question. So this was a question that about 100 years ago, people didn't really know kind of what our universe looked like and kind of what the shape of the universe is. Um, so there, there was questions where does it have an end or not? And people weren't really sure. And we're not actually quite sure about it, but there's what we call the observable universe, which is basically if we see something, it means the light had to travel from where it's being sent to us. So because the universe has only been around for about 14 billion years, we could only see the distance that it could have traveled in that time. So there is sort of an edge, but it's really only an edge of what we could see. And we don't really, because we haven't seen further in our universe than, than that distance, is we don't really know, to be perfectly honest, because we can't observe those parts of the universe yet. Um, but in terms of the expansion of the universe, uh, you could kind of think about a sheet of plastic that's being stretched in every dimension to make things further and further away from one another. So if you took this piece of this piece of rubber, say, and put two points on it, just with a marker, and stretched it, you would see those two points getting further away from one another. So if, if we have an analogy with our universe, we don't really know if this sort of sheet of rubber sort of goes on forever in any direction or if it ends at some point beyond what we could see. So we, we, do, we don't really know exactly what's beyond um, that distance which we could see. Uh, yeah, there's another hand I see. What does a normal day look like to you? Uh, so a normal day is, so I guess I didn't mention this, but I, I work at Environment and Climate Change Canada um, as a physicist there. So I go into work and I work with satellites and these maps uh, to produce maps of pollution on the Earth's surface. Uh, so I do a lot of computer programming because uh, a lot of the ways that we produce these maps and 
create models of the atmosphere um, are very complicated and you can't really like the math problems that you, you do in class just with a pen and paper, you can't, you can't really do that um, with these big complicated models. So I have to be the one to make these models and figure out how they work. So that involves a lot of computer programming. So we uh, make the computers do all these works for us. And we have these big supercomputers that are located just outside of Montreal which are absolutely humongous and take up rooms and have thousands of thousands of microchips on them that make them do humongous computations very quickly. So I, my every day, I work a lot with this supercomputer trying to get it to do what I want to make it to do to basically give me an idea of how the atmosphere is going to behave and how pollution um, is going to travel um, in our air. Okay. Uh, I see another hand up over there. Uh, yeah, the, the 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 person with their hand up could could ask a question. The bring a t-shirt. Um, Rowan, he means you. I know, Lex. What is the radius of the Milky Way? The radius of the Milky Way? Uh, so I think I put it over here. So the diameter is about a um, 100,000 light years across. So the radius being half of the diameter is uh, half that. So about very, very roughly uh, 50,000 light years. Okay.